This week's episode of the Run, Eat, Drink podcast is brought to you by listeners like you. Head on over to patreon.com slash run, eat, drink podcast and subscribe today. Fans, founders, and insiders like you help us keep the Run, Eat, Drink podcast going. And we thank you for your support. Hi, I'm Chris Twiggs, Chief Training Officer for Galloway Training, and you're listening to the Run, Eat, Drink podcast. Welcome to the Run, Eat, Drink podcast. We feature destination races from across the country. And after the race, we take you on a tour of the best local food and beverage to celebrate. So whether you are an elite runner or a back of the packer like us, you'll know the best places to accomplish, explore, and indulge on your next runcation. Hey, welcome to episode 152 of the Runny Drink Podcast. I'm your host, Amy. I'm your co-host, Dana. I'm going to call this a he- episode 152 and a half. Or 152 part deal. 150 deal. 150 deal. This is us re-recording an episode. We tried last night to do a live recording. We really did. We were met with technical difficulties we on did. our end. Oh. And I, I think I broke the internet because did you? we've been without an actual connection to the internet in all of Southwest Florida. If you're a for hours on our internet service provider for since hours. overnight. So Dana, you broke it. I'm going to stop touching buttons. Yeah, don't touch the buttons. So hopefully. No, you didn't break it. I didn't break the internet. Come on. So hopefully we've got all of our uh, IT issues worked out. Yeah. And we will be doing a live recording next week. Stay tuned. Tune in. But and you, be a part of the magic of technology next week. When it works, it's great. <laughs> And I really do enjoy doing the live episodes. I love it. People I love... are having a lot of fun with it. We're getting yeah. a lot of interaction. And yeah. you know, chime, our, our friends from across the internet, really, all three platforms. Across we were getting, the world. And, yeah. And we were getting people chiming in on, on Facebook and YouTube and Periscope. So I love it. Heck yeah. Yeah. It's very cool. But what that means, Amy, yes. is that this is going to be... A laser focused episode because we are focused. We are so I am practiced. Focused. I'm focused. It's like we've had rehearsal. Yes. Thank you, all of the Runcation Nation who contributed to our rehearsal of episode 152. <laughs> and thank you, Chris Twiggs, for your amazing interview last week and the introduction of the show last week and today because you, yeah. He was so great and full of tips and tricks and resources, all kinds of resources for training for that race that you want to achieve. And he was just a lot of fun to talk to on top of that. And I love his tiki glasses, all the tiki stuff. Yes. Yeah. I want to take that video and I want to put it together. I want to edit it. Yeah. I want to edit it Mm -hmm. to uh, for our patrons. Okay. So that they can see those tiki mugs that he talked about. They're very cool. On the show. They are very cool. Yeah. Yeah. While we're saying thank you, we have some new patrons to say thank you to as well. I can't believe that I'm about to say we've added two new patrons in the last 72 hours. That's fantastic. And we can't thank you all enough for supporting our show if you are a patron and to your ranks we add roxanne baggett and jen richley i hope i'm saying the name right i hope that i'm not butchering your last name better known on instagram as roxanne is known as gator granny Mm -hmm. and jen is known as running through wonder running through wonderland we can't thank th- those ladies and the rest of our patrons enough for their support of our show. Exactly. To find out more, join the community, and get even more of the show you love, go to patreon.com slash run, eat, drink podcast. And those two ladies are also members of our run, eat, drink podcast team for the Rundana, just FYI. And we're going to be talking about that a little later on as well. Yeah. But on this week's episode, we are talking Marvel. Yes. I literally, I ran an Iron Man. You ran an Iron Man or 
an Iron Man themed 10K. Well, to be more accurate, but it sounds better when I say it. Yes. Our friends at Metal Chasers, they put together a fantastic virtual series featuring all the Marvel heroes that we love. One of them happens to be Tony Stark, a.k.a. Iron Man, and his virtual 10K is called Part of the Journey is the End, and it features the charity, the Pinky Swear Foundation. So we're going to be talking about that. We're also going to be talking about another arrow you can put in your quiver for your nutritional preparedness as we are kicking off 2021 in in healthful ways. We found a pretty awesome brunch item online that happens to be we in our run, eat, drink podcast test kitchen. Yes. Happens to be vegetarian, (laughs) but you wouldn't know it. If well, you weren't looking for it, because it tastes that awesome. Yes. And we're going to give you some suggestions on how to make it non-vegetarian, but it is a so Southwest sweet potato breakfast hash from Blissful Basil. Yes. Amazing. And we round out the episode with a conversation with Kevin Abbott, owner of Barrel of Monks Brewing. And I can't tell you... What a great interview. He is so, he's so knowledgeable and so talented as an owner of Barrel Monks, as a brewer, as someone who knows about food pairings with beer and with wine, Mm -hmm. FYI, also. I I just, he's fantastic. I can't wait to get back over to Boca Raton where their brewery is. And he gets to talk about a beer that they brew every October to support a cause near and dear to our hearts. Cause that specifically dovetails in very nicely to this month. Of yes. course, since we are running the Donna in support of the Donna Foundation, which yeah. is fighting against breast cancer, this beer helps the fight against breast cancer as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. So we're going to be talking about that as well. Mm. But... Let's talk running first. Yeah, why let's don't you, get into it. Why don't you give us an update on your training? Let everybody know what's going on with you. Well, I'm not running. As we know. As we know. Because so you're doing what the doctor said. My training equals recovery from surgery. And when I saw him at my most recent follow-up, he said, you better not think about running for at least eight weeks. And you Which go, I'm holding you to. And you get, and, and it's, I know it's hard. I know it's really hard for you to hold me to it because I'm seeing everybody out there who has joined our team for the Donna virtual. You guys have no idea how much FOMO is happening in the Costin household right now. It's so hard. Here at the Ring Podcast Tower, there's a whole department of FOMO, and Amy is the department head. He has to talk me off the ledge every day because I want to run with you all so much, and Everybody who is posting, you are inspirational to me, and you also contribute to my FOMO, which means it's just going to be that much sweeter when I get back out there. In the meantime, I'm working with my TheraBeast. Your TheraBeast. Yes, which uh, you have coined and hashtagged. And well, it's, I didn't hashtag it. One of our, uh, one of our uh, patrons, Josh. Did Josh, did Josh hashtag? He hashtagged <laughs> TheraBeast. And I think that's so appropriate. you got to let her know the next time you go in for therapy that yeah. she has her own hashtag now. She, yes, I will. I will. So we, she has upped the game in therapy. She really wants to avoid any patellar tendonitis. And you should avoid that. That sounds. I, yeah. Like an ouch. Mm-hmm. Any irritation around the knee area. So we're, we're, we're doing physical therapy around that. Yes, you have heard me talk about wall sits. But this week I had balance. I had focused balance work where I stood on one leg and I had to throw a ball at a trampoline. I know this exercise. Yeah. So the trampoline is tilted up against the wall. There's an X on it, and I have to throw the ball at the X and then catch it while on one leg. Yep, yep. Now, I only had to do that 15 times this time, 
I feel like it's going to increase as I go back and the wall sits are going to increase in time. And it's all to get me back into the shape where I can go back to work and where I can get back to running with everyone in the Runcation Nation. Yeah, everything she's doing now is really all about supporting those little muscles that are around the knee and that you don't think about. You know, everybody thinks about, you know, the quads. They think about their hamstrings. Oh, and we're they working think about that. Their calves. And you are. But totally. You're, you're also doing those exercises. You're working those little itty-bitty supporting muscles. Mm-hmm. Yes, but we're also working the quads and the hamstrings, just not to diminish any of that work. But I'm doing well, and I am... N- trying to find the balance at home with my homework. Yeah, her therapist or therapist is giving mm-hmm. her homework mm-hmm. to do. And Amy got a little overzealous with it. A I went of too weeks far ago. and it was, yeah. So I'm trying to find the balance so that I do the work, I f- get the positive long-term effect, but I don't irritate overdo it. it or irritate or cause any additional your effects impacts good policy yeah so that's it i can't wait until i can run again with everybody in the run the rest of us here at the running drink podcast towers look forward to hearing the latest update from the department of fomo (laughs) the department of fomo (laughs) let's talk about the department of running the department of running actually had some equipment failures so we oh yeah so yesterday I did the uh, 10K uh, after work yes. that we're going to be talking about. And this week's 10K is the, actually it's the last in the series from Metal Chasers, the last of their Metal Chasers Assemble series. They finish with this race. This is the Tony Stark race themed after Iron, and Man. Iron Man, but I'm going to spoil Avengers Endgame in five seconds, four, four seconds, seconds, three, two, one at the end of Avengers Endgame, Tony Stark dies, and that's part of the meaning behind the name of this race. Mm. Part of the journey is the end. The Marvel Cinematic Universe phases began with Iron Man. Some would argue it actually began with Hulk, but it began with Iron Man, and it ended with Avengers Endgame. So it really has his story arc bookending the first part of the marvel cinematic universe great race the metal we talked about it last night on the live it is a hefty beautiful metal it's color coded with the gold rod red gold and hot rod red just like his costume hot rod red his armor And what I love about the metal is it's showing Iron Man in flight with his hand outstretched. I love that. Like he's blasting with his repulsor, and Mm -hmm. there's a light feature on the metal. So you hit the button Mm -hmm. on the back, and the light flashes, looking like he's blasting his repulsor. And the top, what I like is that the title of this particular race is at the top, while Metal Chaser, Metal Chasers Assemble. I got it. Metal (laughs) Chasers Assemble is at the bottom. Yes. And it's embossed. It's so great. It is. And I also like to brag, and I'm weird this way, I like to brag about the bib on their bibs. You love that. They send you a nicely color matched bib, full Mm -hmm. color. It says part of the journey is the end up top. You get your race number. It says metal chasers assemble at the bottom. Much like the metal. I like this because unlike some virtuals that send you a virtual bib that you can print on your own at home, which never works really. I mean, we try. Yeah, but they get gross. They get we sweaty. Try. Unless you put them in like, like a plastic sleeve or something. Mm. Just, it's not the same. Like a sheet protector. Yeah. You, know, you get a nice Tyvek, which, which this material is just impervious. You can crumble it. You, you can't tear it. And it doesn't really get water Which is good for me because I'm rough on bibs during a run. Yeah. Mm. So I think it's really nice to get something like that. It's color matched Mm -hmm. to the ribbon. And the ribbon on the metal is a double-sided satin ribbon. It says part of the journey is the end. Again, it is high quality from beginning to end. So I decided yesterday that I was going to run this race after work. I initially Mm -hmm. thought I might get up before work and do it, but... 
that wasn't happening. So I, mm-hmm. I decided instead I was going to run it when I got off work, which I did. Exactly. Came home, changed clothes, grabbed some water, headed right out. Yep. What I realized was I am in need of new shoes. So sometimes a run teaches you that exact thing. I knew it. I knew at the 5K mark I needed new shoes. I was regretting not stopping the run to go buy them by at that point by the end of mile six. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, I had no. severe just aches in both ankles, and I was starting to get some aches along the front of my shins. You have to have the right shoes, and they have to be in good condition. Yeah. Otherwise, you risk injury. These just had a lot of miles on them. And, and normally, I can tell mm-hmm. when it's time. Yeah. And, and what would have happened typically with a shorter distance run for me, like a, a three-mile training run, I would have felt that at the end and said, oh, okay, tomorrow I'm going to get shoes. I had three more miles to do after that. And after being on them for the first three, that second three miles really didn't feel good. Mm. So needless yeah. to say, I got rid of those. I went today to our local run shop, which is called The Run Shop, or Shopee here in Cape Coral. With an E. Shop with an E, with two P's and an E. And And saw our friend Rachel Lee. She's amazing. She's the one that got us into the right shoes. Because when we started this running journey, we did everything wrong, like we talked about with Chris Twiggs last week. Exactly. And we just bought off the shelf at an outlet thinking it would be right for us but it's not no it's not for anybody you have to have what they call a gait analysis yeah get your gait analysis done and get the shoe that goes with your biomechanics yes because there is no one perfect shoe for everyone and we get that question a lot people Mm -hmm. ask what's the best running shoe? shoe yeah and the answer is it depends and we are diehard Brooks fans, Brooks addictions, but other people prefer Ghost. Some people go oh. away from Brooks totally. Some like I for work, I will wear New Balance, and some people they run in Asics. Some people run in Mizuno's, and I have Under Armour for work. Yeah, it just it you have to get what works for you. And for the activity that you're and doing. for the activity. And there are a lot of people that find one shoe that is a do-it-all. And if you're lucky enough to be able to do that, good for you. Yeah. But there are different shoes that serve different purposes oftentimes. And right. you just have to get what works for you. And you have to go to an expert when it comes to running. Luckily, I got to spend a little bit of time with the expert today. I picked mm-hmm. up the new shoes. Yeah. So I can't wait to get these things broken in because I have some runs coming up this weekend for the Donna, which we'll be talking about in a little while. Yeah. But yesterday for the Ironman, part of the journey is the N 10 K. What I did starting out was basically I started out nice and slow with a 555 pace, Five seconds running, 55 seconds walking, following the Galloway method. And then in mile two, I did a 1050, mile three, a 1545, mile four, 2040, and then I started going back down. So he's giving you ratios of running in the shorter ratio to walking. Yeah, five seconds running, 10 seconds running, 15, and then 20. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was a nice way to ease into it, peak and then back off and finish. So my energy level was very good mm-hmm. at the end, but at the end of that six miles, my feet were howling. Just done. Yeah, they were done. Yeah. So yeah. this week I'll be breaking. I got a couple of uh, short runs to do before breaking this weekend. Breaking some new shoes. To break in the new shoes. You Excellent. never want to break in new shoes on race day. No. Mm-mm. Get at least a 5K or two in before your first race in a new pair of shoes. Somehow, some way, get some distance on those shoes just a little bit. And so that you your feet can become comfortable, so you can become accustomed, so that the lacing is right. Everything. Because otherwise, you may be discovering new blisters you mm-hmm. didn't know about. Yeah. 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 So you don't want to do that on race day. No. No. So, so make sure that you have equipment that is up to par and that has been broken in. Right. That is the key so that you can finish fabulous virtual races 
like this Metal Chasers Assemble series, part of the journey is the end, that features the Pinky Swear Foundation as its charity. Now talk about that charity a little bit. The Pinky Swear Foundation is at PinkySwearFoundation.org. PinkySwear.org, sorry. And according to their website, the Pinky Swear Foundation eases the financial and emotional impact experienced by children with cancer and their families, providing basic needs, providing basic needs support during very challenging times. It's just an amazing mission, and I think one that connects to what we are doing as a podcast with the Donna. Yeah, it's so it's, much. Yeah, this is a similar mission to mm-hmm. the Donna Foundation yes. and complementary in in, mm-hmm. in many respects. The fact that we're able to support more than one amazing organization this week with what we're doing. Yeah. I'm pretty happy about that. It's amazing. But again, we've talked about virtuals in the past. Yeah. A lot of people are like, I don't know about a virtual. I feel like I'm just buying a metal. <laughs> For me, I like well, having that external motivator and I, sure. like, I like having a goal that I can set and say, I'm not going to wear that. I'm not going to display that until I've done the miles. So it gives you the intr- extrinsic motivator to get out there and get it done. But also intrinsically, you feel like you are serving a purpose and supporting a great organization in the Pinky Square Foundation, in the Donna Foundation. And it, I, it's... It moves you when you think about the battles that they go through. Oh, absolutely. When they w- when you battle cancer, children battling cancer, anybody battling breast cancer. And I hearken back to two weeks ago when we had the, the executive director of the Donna Foundation on, yeah. Amanda Napolitano, and she said, there's another reason to do the virtuals, to make sure that our live in-person races return. Absolutely. Yeah. And a it, lot of people forget. <laughs> and, and and now the Metal Chasers doesn't normally have live events, but virtuals in general, many of your local race organizers have converted to virtual events. Mm-hmm. Many of them have done so because they want to hold these events. Mm-hmm. They want to do what they can for the running community. Yes. The other part of that is the housekeeping side of things sure. which is there are bills to pay there are whether the event is happening or not oftentimes right. many times some dollars have already been committed in these by these organizations in anticipation of events that were going to happen but didn't because of the global pandemic so by supporting these organizations and doing their virtuals, you're helping them keep their doors open so that when live and in-person races return Mm -hmm. in that particular area, they're still going to be around. And with an organization like Metal Chasers, you are guaranteeing that there are charitable organizations that get support and you are giving yourself an impetus to keep training, to keep going in these uncertain times. Yeah, I know that when the pandemic first started, people were looking for anything to do, and there was a lot of focus on what can we do at home, what can we do alone or just with our own families and all that. In in some parts of the country, that's a little more relaxed than others. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, for the most part, there's still a push for people to find events that are more socially distanced and more controlled. And by doing a virtual run in your neighborhood or in a, in your local park, you're still able to participate with the rest of the running community, Mm -hmm. but you're doing it in your own way Mm -hmm. and you're still doing it for a good cause. Absolutely. So we applaud Metal Chasers for their support of the Pinky Swear Foundation and for their amazing bibs, their amazing medals. Please check them out at their website. We link to them in the show notes. And we can't wait for that anti-hero They have two series, series coming up this year. First half of the year is anti-heroes. And so yes. when we talk about anti-heroes, we're talking about they're, they're sticking with the Marvel theme. Ugh. And they are doing... Characters such as, including but not limited to, 
The Punisher. Oh my goodness. Deadpool. Ah, oh, so good. Wolverine from the X Men. So they've got that happening. Then you, second yeah. half of the year, and we were lucky enough to have one of the founders of metal chasers in our live last Christina night Craig yes she confirmed for us that in the second half of the year a villain series the villain series I'm is coming so excited and if there's anything that we have learned from this year maybe learned taking a page from Disney we know that villain themed races tend to do very well Oh, yeah. I think this is going to be insanely popular. And we encourage you to check out Metal Chasers. I, members of the Runcation Nation, have been posting all this past week other races outside of the Metal Chasers Assemble series. And I just think that there are so many, and you can find one that supports a charity that really touches you and has a theme and a medal that is amazing. So... So check them out. We're going to have a link to them in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Metal Chasers, thank you so much for what you guys are doing. Really? Christina, Bill, you rock. And helping us be able to keep pounding out the miles on the road. Can't wait to have you back on the show. But I wasn't able to do this run just by coming home, grabbing water, and going. I did skip a step. Oh, you didn't tell people that I cooked for you. Amy cooked for me. And we actually put this question out to the Runcation Nation last night during the live chat. And we asked, what do you think about breakfast or brunch items for dinner? And overwhelmingly, people were like, yes. Breakfast any time of day. Absolutely. And, you know. I agree. I I do, too. I I, do. Yeah. I do. And last night was no exception when you made this ridiculously delicious Southwest sweet potato breakfast hash that you found on Blissful Basil's website. Yes. Blissfulbasil.com. And it's a young woman named Ashley that does plant-based recipes and it's just we love to continue this series in 2021 where we feature healthy bites that we make in our own kitchen we've talked about hummus as a snack we've talked about chili food group in our house food group yes we've talked about cold soaked oats as a breakfast item Mm -hmm. we've talked about chili oh yeah and the various ways that we do that when we are training and when we're eating vegan and vegetarian six days out of the week. And I like that we're bringing hash into this because a hash mm. is such a versatile dish because you yes. can make it with basically leftovers and a potato. It's so true. And I can't tell you, we didn't feature the hash that we had out there in California In downtown Disney after the Avengers races, but that was potatoes, that was, I think it was bacon, peppers, it had an egg, it was delicious. I want to say there might have been short rib in that one too. Oh yeah. If I'm not mistaken. True. That is true. So I just, we've had amazing hash. But you can do... A hash with short rib. And you mentioned but you could do one with short rib. You could do one with bacon. Mm-hmm. You could do one with Chorizo. Both. Chorizo. Or you could do one without a meat. At all. At all. And no egg. Which is what you did. Yes. And I didn't do it with like a Yukon Gold. I didn't do it with a russet potato. I did it with sweet potato. And I think that that is something that a lot of people forget about. So Mm. many people look at sweet potatoes as a lunch or dinner item. Or a dessert, like in a casserole at at holiday time. Right. Mm. But this as a compliment or the main starch in, in a breakfast or brunch item. It can be hearty and it depends on how you spice it. We'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So this recipe incorporates sweet potato, onion, garlic in the base. And then the spices are turmeric, cumin, and smoked paprika. Nice. Mm. Yeah, it did give it a really Southwestern flair. Yeah. And I just, I, the, the way that the recipe calls for it and the amounts and the process and everything is up on blissfulbasil.com. But it calls for coconut oil. 
As the cooking oil. As the cooking oil. Okay. And I know normally we don't use anything like that, but I wanted to be true to the recipe. Yeah, you're, this was an experiment for you. Mm-hmm. It, it, true to how it was cooked. I think that you can, you can cook the potatoes in a variety of ways, but this was in a cast iron skillet with the coconut oil, with the garlic, with the onion. And we didn't use a ton. And, there was a tablespoon in the whole yeah. recipe. Yeah, and with the potatoes, and you just, you cook them in there, and you get that kind of crust on the bottom of the pan, and you keep stirring them ever so frequently, and and it just creates this base of sweetness, of smoke, of spice, and, and just, it's a flavor bomb. Yeah, so you had this killer hash, mm, and yeah. then, you know, that was the potatoes, the onion, the garlic, mm-hmm. then at the end, you threw in fresh cut cilantro right that's a green herbaceous element Mm -hmm. we know that there is a small subset of the population out there that isn't a big fan of cilantro so leave it out you could you could totally leave it out totally um but then you also had these other killer toppings going on with this hash yes so to add an extra layer of texture and an extra layer of flavor There were a couple of different, there were three different toppings. Mm -hmm. So there was a guacamole, and we have talked about making guacamole back on quick bite number seven. Yeah, we're, we keep, we do guacamole quite a lot because you can make it, it'll last for a couple of days. It's fresh, it's healthful, Mm -hmm. it goes with anything. You can put it on toward like a whole grain tortilla, you can put it on just vegetables. Come on. It's an amazing dip. So avocado, our recipe calls for avocado, tomato, onion, jalapeno, uh, lime, and then various spices. So you can do adobo, but if you don't want the hit of sodium, you could do just the components without the sodium, like cumin, like garlic, garlic powder, like onion powder, just the assembly line of spices. Or you could do adobo. If you don't mind the added sodium and and then lime and that, if you let it marry overnight or a couple of hours, so flavorful and you can add salt if you're not worried about salt. Yeah. It's good. Fresh. It's great. A couple hours afterward Mm -hmm. or overnight. And pico is part of this recipe, which is generally really finely cut tomato and onion and I put in cilantro and lime. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Think, and, think of it as a heartier salsa almost. Mm-hmm. And it's a more finely cut one mm-hmm. in this recipe. And we we also had something that I had never thought to do to combine coconut milk and chipotle in adobo sauce. Chipotle peppers in adobo. Yeah, the, what's really cool is you can either get coconut milk, put it in the fridge, and then the fattier components will float to the top and then solidify. Right. And that's what you would use. Or you can get coconut cream, which is more of the coconut fat that's in that whipped consistency. And you mixed in that the adobo, the adobo sauce from Chipotle peppers is not to be confused with the adobo spice that you right. were talking about. The dry adobo spice. Two different for, things. Yeah, that you yep. might use in, in guacamole is different. But the deep, rich adobo sauce that mm. chipotle peppers are often packed in. It's so good. And it's so it, it can add a kick oh. depending on how much you add. So you can use this according to the spice level you want. But you chop up the pepper, you add a little bit of the sauce, and then you puree that in a blender. Mm. And then, so you have the base of the potato and onion and garlic mixture with the little cilantro mixed in. So the hash itself. The hash itself. And then you have a little bit of the guacamole, a little bit of the pico, and a little bit of the drizzle of that sauce. Oh, it's got layers of spice, layers of texture, and layers of flavor. Yeah, this was so surprisingly good. I was like, this has become a staple in the house now. Yeah. Because we tend to keep really all of the constituent components in the house. 
True. The whole thing comes together. And we've never, actually, I think, in, in honestly, in all the years we've been married, we've never cooked sweet potato in that way. We've never just diced and cubed up sweet potato and then put it in a skillet. So that was a, a new way to do that. And yep. it worked really well. So the whole thing comes together in about 25 minutes. Mm-hmm. You know, you put your favorite podcast on in the background, start listening. And next thing you know, brunch is served regardless uh, of the time of day. Yeah. I had it for dinner as a pre-race mm-hmm. fuel. Yeah. I thought it was fantastic. Well, good. And what I loved about it was you didn't miss any of the other animal protein if you didn't have it. So just as is, Mm -hmm. it was super flavorful. Like you said, you had crunchy, creamy, smoky, a little bit of sweet, a little bit of, yeah, you had everything going on there. Yeah. Now, you take this base and you decide, that's good. Mm -hmm. I want some protein in there. And you You decide you're going to maybe do some pulled chicken or you're going to do some sausage or you're going to do some chorizo or whatever the case may be Mm -hmm. you're gonna be super happy with the result especially if you like maybe added your protein into the hash so that it gets a little bit of the crispy crust on it when it's cooking in the cast iron Mm -hmm. or at the end you top this thing with a poached egg oh or a fried egg or fried egg doesn't matter you're going to be in heaven so good so there's there is nothing wrong with this recipe at all. So yeah. we are going to be linking to yes. this. Blissfulbasil.com. We will link right to that recipe. So you can play with the components. You could do it as is. It's amazing. And I just, I we've never met Ashley, but thank you, Ashley, for your plant-based recipes at blissfulbasil.com. Just terrific. But before we go on, we wanted to talk about the Donna Marathon weekend. It's one that we've often talked about and recommended highly as a bucket list runcation. We have, yes. And months ago, very early on, amid the pandemic, so many unknowns, the race organizers, including Amanda Napolitano that we've had on the show, decided, let's just let our community know, we're going to do it virtually and we're going to make it incredible so we heard this announcement we registered we created a team and now so many of you almost 30 of you as of the time of this recording we're 29 Uh members of the runcation nation team so many of you have joined us on the team and we want as many of you to join in the fun as we can have The virtual events can be completed in a variety of ways. There are distances ranging from Uh 0.0. So if your idea of a marathon involves Netflix, we've got the event for you. Absolutely. Yes. All the way up to an ultra marathon. They can be completed anytime between February 6th and 14th to submit official results. That's if you really want to get your name up there and compete and see where you fall on the leaderboard. Or you can be like me, still recovering not cleared to run yet, you can still register before Valentine's Day and you can complete the distance over time, accomplish a goal at your own pace by March 30th and or 31st. And what's even better is they didn't skimp on the swag and the medals and the the stuff you're going to get. So if you do the 0.0, you get an awesome car magnet. Yeah. 5K, half marathon and marathon. They have amazing medals. They have a bib, they have medals, they have shirts. It's Ultra marathoners get the belt (sighs) buckle. And you can opt into whatever swag you want, and it will be mailed to you. There are only a few days left to register. You have to register. No matter how you're going to complete it, you have to register by Valentine's Day. Uh, Valentine's Day is the last day to register. Become a part of the Running Drink podcast team. Run the distance of your own choosing at your own pace Support an amazing organization in the Donna Foundation that supports those who are fighting breast cancer, their families, and continued research to end the disease. Go to runeatdrink.net slash Donna by February 14th and register. Join our team. And we want to thank all of you who've joined the team already. And we thank you for supporting us in this important cause as we run everywhere together. This week, we are going to be talking with one of our favorite 
brewer, brewery owner guys. We have talked yes. to them a couple of times in person, both at racing events and at the tap room yeah. over at oh, Barrel true. of Monks That Brewing. is so true. He came in when we were we had just stopped by to see the tap room for the first time. Yeah. It was incredible. And oh. Kevin is just a, a fantastic guy. So much fun to talk to. Way back on Quick Bite number 12, we <sighs> featured their beer wizard wit and den of sins on episode 24 yes and now we're going to talk with owner kevin abbott about a special release we're going to talk about the history of the brewery the foundation of their their flagship beers and a special release that's done every october that we happen to snag at total wine at this time of year Witty in Pink. So, without further ado, we present to you Kevin Abbott from Barrel Amongst Brewing in Boca Raton. My name is Kevin Abbott. I'm one of the owners of Barrel Amongst Brewing, and my actual title is Director of Operations. We're big fans. Yeah. Big fans. We also really enjoyed the, the opportunity we had when we were over there to <sighs> check out your tap room yes. as well at the brewery what a beautiful space you guys have it really well, is you. yeah being in boca raton and doing the kind of beers we do which are, are almost exclusively with now a few minor changes over the last couple of weeks actually mostly belgian inspired ales mostly classic styles timeless styles that have been around mm. for hundreds of years we really wanted to kind of invoke that ideal of having the a kind of a classic almost like a, a wine a uh, wine bar tasting room and and make sure that we put off the kind of kind of represent ourselves both in the beer we make and the uh, the impression we want to make when you walk in the front door oh it's so it just feels so great in there and the are i like what the barrel staves are still on the wall right yeah. We mm -hmm. haven't been there in, in, in a little while, in a hot minute, but we love the atmosphere and just, uh, we would love to come over there and hang out so much. Let's rewind a little bit. Okay. okay. We were fortunate Sorry. enough to discover your brewery when we were over on the East coast of Florida for yes. a couple of smaller races mm -hmm. that th these are the types of races that are now starting to make a comeback yes. in Florida and in other States across the country. And we were fortunate enough to get exposed to Barrel of Monks with a particular beer. Oh, yes. Uh, the Wizard Wit. Mm. And, mm -hmm. you know, we were hoping that you could tell us a little bit of the, uh, a little bit about your brewery and your history. You just said that you like to do some of these traditional styles, but tell us a little bit about the history of the brewery itself and, and some of your inspirations. Sure. So I have three partners, Matt Sadie, Keith Deloach, and Bill McPhee. And these guys had, before I came along as their friend, they had already been friends for 10, 15, 20 years. They had been early adopters of the craft beer movement, loving craft beer. And back then, in Florida in particular, it was a beer wasteland. You, you really couldn't get your hands on. There was very little American craft down here, but there mm. was the stuff that was around was Chimay. It was Delirium. It was yeah. Wedrin. Actually, not West Wedrin, because that wasn't even distributed at that time, but West Mall and the classic Trappist Ale. So <sighs> they fell in love with the Belgian ales then. And ended up doing a lot of trips to Belgium, meeting brewers, going to craft beer bars. And then they decided, hey, listen, we want to have our own brewery. So their whole desire was to have a Belgian-inspired brewery. They felt that Belgian beer was the best beer in the world. So they started to put together their own little backyard homebrew setup and start down that road of trying to make great beer. Mm -hmm. And it was a long road for them, you know, 10 years in the making from when they first started kind of thinking about it to when it actually got done. And I was working at another brewery in South Florida when the craft beer movement in South Florida first started. This is back when the Cigar City was relatively new and all that. So it was really in the early days of craft beer in Florida in general. And I was a brewer and I made friends with these guys and they said, hey, we want to have you come over and work with us. We'll give Mikey a partner and we'll be off to the races. So that was back in uh, 2015 Ooh. that all that happened. I started in actually 
2014 in September and the brewery opened in early 2015. In the beginning and for the most part still to this day, we only do Belgian style ales, meaning that we use Belgian style ale yeast. We use all European malted hops. And while we do stuff like our witty and pink, which is a raspberry wit, and we will be releasing our cherry chocolate quadruple Mm -hmm. in a week or so. We do some of the more wild and culinary Uh inspirations and some of that stuff. We do really hang our hat on the classic styles. And the Wizard Wit, which is our flagship, which is uh, with the beer that you uh, mentioned first, if you go into any good Belgian brewery, you got to have a good white or wit. And Mm -hmm. Wizard is the the vast majority of our production is Wizard Wit. It's the first beer we ever brewed on our brew system. It is the straw that stirs the drink. It is the thing that keeps the lights on. And it is the beer that we're mostly known for. If you walk into a bar in Florida and see a barrel among us draft handle, you're more than likely staring at a a Wizard Wit. So it's really an important thing. It's a 5.5% Belgian wit beer. It's clean. It's dry. It's brewed with orange and coriander. It's not as sweet as some of the commercial examples your blue moons your shock tops of the world mm. and it's uh it's a beer that we're real proud of i think it's one that you really should be proud of oh my goodness yes I, you're talking my language as mm. you start talking about your love for belgian styles i yeah i mean you're in friendly territory here anyway and wizard <laughs> wit is one that we've sought out and and purchased to have here at the house once we discovered it at that race absolutely mm. yeah I, and and that is Turning our, not turning our noses up at, that's the, but <laughs> foregoing some of the more readily available, large brewery, commercially available yeah. wits to find yours because mm-hmm. it has that great flavor profile you're talking about. It's not as sweet. No. It's more dry, but those notes really do come through. The important thing in everything, so first of all, you've got the classic style guidelines and American breweries, for the most part, everything's bigger in the U.S., right? So if we're going to make... <laughs> If we're going to make a beer, it's going to be sweeter. It's going to be more hoppy. It's going to be more bitter. We're going to take whatever that nuance is, and we're going to turn it up to 11, so to speak. Mm. And if you go into those classic Belgian, I'll tell you a quick story. So we've done a bunch of collaborations with Belgian breweries, including uh-huh. uh, Fort Le Pan, Abbey de Rock, some great small craft breweries. Some of them are some of the oldest in Belgium as far as their craft side. And oh. We had the owner, I believe, of, of Abbey de Rock, or no, actually, it was Fort Le Pan was in, and it was trying our, our triple, and the notes that they're looking for are so much more nuanced than what we as American breweries are looking for, and we were drinking through some of these beers, and he's trying our beers and saying some very complimentary things. And when we went to brew our beer together, we made a beer with hibiscus and coriander, mm-hmm. a triple with hibiscus and coriander. Now, the coriander we use in our wit is, you know, X amount of pounds per batch, let's just say. He cut the amount of coriander that he wanted to use in a higher gravity beer with a bigger flavor profile to one quarter of what we use. Oh, wow. His thought is, I don't even want to tell you it's in there. I want it to be a whisper of that flavor. When we say something is, hey, there's orange peel in this. We really want you to taste it. Mm. That's kind of the American craft brew thing. Whereas a lot of the classic European beers, the German beers, the Belgian beers, they want these very faint, subtle hints that you barely notice unless you mention it. And I think we try to straddle that line. We try to... Uh Give a nod to that because that's subtlety, that's complexity, that is elegance to a certain degree. It's like a great bottle of champagne, right? Yeah. You get hints and notes and nothing beats you over the head. At the same time, we want to deliver the flavor and the complexity, the, the punchy in the face aspect to something mm. that, is, that is, is what the American consumer wants. And it's, <laughs> hard, it's, a hard, it's a hard balance sometimes to strike. Now, can I ask a question? I, I just I love your connection to the the rich history and that and the, the differences between the American scene and the European scene. Uh, but I want to go to the name, if I could, for a minute. Wizard sure. Wit. How did mm-hmm. that come up? What's the st- is there a story behind the naming of the beer, your flagship beer? This is not going to be as interesting as you want it to be. Okay. <laughs> uh, we were trying to have a, we had a hard time. I, naming beers is the bane of my existence. 
Okay. You can come up with the best name you ever heard of. You can be struck by inspiration in the middle, in the middle of the night and think you have the most creative, nuanced, once in a lifetime name. You check the, you check online and there's seven beers named that. Ah. It is really tough to name beers. We were trying to come up with a name for our wit beer and we like the alliteration of the two W's, Wizard Wit. And we do have some Lord of the Rings fans in our ownership group. And we ended up coming up with, with Wizard. And it really just kind of stemmed from there. There wasn't anything that was that much, there wasn't that much more thought put into it other than the fact that we thought, hey, this is a cool alliterative sound to it. It's going to have some good imagery to it. Well, and we got a Lord of the Rings fan, so it worked out. I'm telling you, you said you didn't think it would be that interesting, but let me tell you, I was a classroom English language arts teacher for 10 years. So mm -hmm. to me, that connection is awesome, <laughs> I think. Can, uh, yeah, but naming is tough, I'll tell you. It, yeah? that's Is it yeah. the toughest part of the process for you? It's one of the things is I've worked in several breweries over the years and the amount of times where we've had a beer, a recipe, we've been standing around a tank with a finished product going, okay, now what the hell are we going to name it? <laughs> that happens more often than not than the other way where you're coming with a great name and you have to make a recipe for it. So yeah. it's one of the more difficult things. I mean, don't get me wrong, making great beer, the, the science behind it is complicated. There's a lot that goes into it, but what people, the name of a beer is the identity of it. It's mm. people are looking for the story. It's the thing that's going to jump off the shelf at somebody. So there's a lot of anxiety built around it. Is this the right name? Is it going to resonate with people? So I think that's more where, where we kind of lose sleep sometimes going, well, is this, is this the right name for this beer? I yeah. guess we're going to put it on there and see what, see what happens. Marketing. Yeah. And so yeah. You can't discount the importance of, of yeah. good marketing because if you can make the best beer in the world, if nobody notices it on the shelf, then Sorry about that. Our dogs decided that they agreed with us, and uh, they they occasionally will chime in on the show. But well, they're smart dogs. They are, and actually, our girl dog loves beer, so she would try to get her nose into this pint if she could. But no, the market <laughs> the marketing is important, and if people aren't noticing your beer in that sea of offerings that are out there, especially as the craft brew scene has exploded, then it doesn't matter how great your beer might be and i mean you guys are fortunate you have great marketing and great beer yeah and yeah, great artwork too yes we appreciate that and you know it, it's a lot of different people it's it's marketing people it's design people it's a lot of people have to come together to make this all work but there are tons and tons of beers there when i get asked hey what's your favorite beer or cool. what's your favorite local brewery it's i always I, i'm always saying something that people are like oh i never heard of them or oh i wouldn't think about them because they're not the first ones that come to mind because i'm as a brewer as a former brewer i don't brew anymore but as a former brewer i'm looking at things and tasting things differently than most average consumers so i'm looking for competency and style. So is this mm. lager, this amber lager, does it taste like an amber lager is supposed to taste? Mm. And looking at things on that level yeah. and not necessarily looking at the marketing of it, but when you're running a brewery, like the position I am now, we're thinking about those things all the time. And I, I say all the time, everyone makes great beer. There's great beer all over the state of Florida, all over the country, all over the world. So you're a guy that makes really good beer. Now what? <laughs> how, how, how are you going to get someone to drink it the first time and become a fan and maybe it's because you name a beer witty and pink and we do you know a lot of charitable donations around it and we put raspberry in it and we got good design maybe that's why you try it for the first time maybe it's because you walk by and you see a wizard staring at you on the six pack and you go hey i like lord of the rings or harry potter or what have you you got to find a hook to get people to, to try you for the first time and give you a chance instead of somebody else. Well, our first in entree, like we said, was Wizard Wit, but we've also fallen in love with your Parade of Souls. Oh, that's, that's one that's not very readily available, too. It's usually only sold in the tasting room. We know. We know. <laughs> <laughs> and we're very unhappy about that. I mean, you know. <laughs> Is there a cool story behind that beer? Uh, that was actually a name. So... When I was working at the brewery that I was at before, I really, I love Imperial Stouts, and I love the idea of doing a Belgian Imperial Stout. 
So when I came over as the as the head brewer with Bill McPhee, who was the brewmaster and the kind of the impetus behind most of the beginnings of Barrel of Monks, we both wanted to do an imperial style. We thought it would be a really great idea, the big fruity flavors of Belgian yeast with the nice roasted aspects of a great big rich imperial style. It just sounded like magic. It does. So we, it was one of the first beers that we brewed. It was in the first eight. We had eight recipes that we brewed for our grand opening, and that was one of them. And Parade of Souls was just a name that I had come up with about a year or so before that I just liked, and I had in the file on my phone. <laughs> that was, okay, these are some names that we can pull from. And I felt like Parade of Souls, it comes out around ha- Halloween every year. Oh. It's uh, Dark beer, you've, I'm guessing, since you've had the beer, you've seen the label. Mm-hmm. Uh, we ha- it, it's, it just kind of all worked together. So, And then we do a, a bourbon barrel version of Parade of Souls called Den of Sins. And that is uh, released uh, kind of around the Mardi Gras time every year. So it's a bourbon barrel version of that from the previous year, aged in bourbon barrels, and then comes out about five months after the regular batch. And... As far now, the regular parade of souls clocks in around ten percent ABV. Does that barrel yep. aging add something to it, or are we still in the ten percent range? About 05 percent. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. So, so we, we we list that at ten point five. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very nice. Now, uh, you guys have a a resident food truck. Yes. And. and Would you recommend specific food pairings with either of those two beers we just talked about, the Parade of Souls or Wizard Wit, whether it's from the food truck or from somewhere else? Food pairings in beer are something that's kind of something that I love. Before I got into beer, I was a wine steward. I worked in wine for about seven years. (laughs) That's fantastic. Yeah, so I, that's where I thought it was going to be. I was working in the restaurant industry, and I thought I would do that my whole life. And I, I kind of fell into home brewing, and, and everything took off from there. The pairings thing is very important to me. Wizard Wit is a great beer for lighter fare, being a, a, a wit beer. It goes well with lighter kind of curry dishes. Ooh. Uh, and coriander and orange peel plays into some of those flavors. Goat cheese is a really nice thing with wizards. So if you're talking about maybe something like a, uh, a salad with strawberry vinaigrette and goat cheese, that's a great flavor profile and something to go with the wizard. Uh, your imperial stouts, a lot of people are going to go for, you think about coffee rub steak, right? You get oh. those roasted flavors. So you go with something like a, 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 a sirloin with a brown butter sauce. That would be a really nice thing to go with something like an imperial stout. And you you can also do big rich desserts a big mol- a molten chocolate cake uh, something of that that richness that kind of matches power to power with something like that mm. so th- those are the kind of things that just come to my head now talking about our food truck oh we, we so chef eats uh, was a, was one of the first trucks we ever worked with when we opened in 2015 and we used to have a rotating list of food trucks and we got together about a year and a half ago maybe two years now and said, hey, we want a consistent food option. We want to be able to do pairings more often. We want to be able to do beer dinners. We want to be able to do things together. And I'm sure you don't want to drive your truck around everywhere if you don't have to. It just turned out they were one of our more popular food trucks. They worked well with us. Uh, Jeff Lemmerman is a great chef. He's extremely talented with flavors. He's got a great personality. He's, he was just the kind of person we'd like to work with. So we came up with this pairing. He's now there every day. He parks his truck there. And it's given us a little more ability to do more interesting things because we have a consistent partner. And he does, he's won Best Burger in Boca, the, bur- the Burger Boca, the Boca Burger Bash. He's won Best <laughs> Say Best that Burger. five times fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. But he's won that. He makes a great burger, great chicken wings, tacos, American pub fare, and then can do some of the best kind of artisanal food that you've ever had. He's able to do everything from a great burger to a great filet mignon and and everything in between. So it's been a really good uh, pairing for us, and it gives our customers a chance to know what they're going to get when they come in. They can look online for the menu. They don't have to go, oh, do they have tacos today? Oh, no, they have an Italian sandwich truck. Consistency is really important. Yeah. We've been seeing a lot of breweries start to do that more frequently, especially since the pandemic began. But it's you guys were ahead of the curve in Mm -hmm. that respect. I think it's incredibly smart. Yeah, and this is the thing. Consistency is everything with the customer base. And they want to know what they're getting themselves into. And the ability to have something different is good, too. 
for some people, but there's a reason why chain restaurants have been successful for as long as they have, because you, they might, even if they're not making the best food, you know exactly what you're going to get. And mm. I think when we're, when you're able to do, Hey, you know that your beer is going to be good. You know that these five drafts are going to be the same every time. Mm. So if you only like your wizard, come in and drink your wizard. Uh, we'd love you to try something else, but Hey, listen, enjoy what you know, what you like. And when you've got good beer and you've got consistent and just so happens to be great food, it's a great match. So, Now, to the reason that we're really here with you. We are... Dum, dum, dum. Are are you ready? Are you ready? (laughs) I don't think I knew this, so I'm I'm sitting down now. You're sitting down, your palms are sweaty. No, seriously. (laughs) You're amazing. (laughs) Your beer knowledge, your food knowledge, your... Lord, this man needs to take us through a wine tasting, apparently, but... I'm hungry listening to everything you're talking about just now. I know, but... uh, On Valentine's Day weekend, we'll be running the Donna Marathon weekend virtual events. And these are events that are normally hosted in Jacksonville Beach. And that is the home of the Mayo Clinic. And it it supports breast cancer research and supports families and those who are fighting that battle. And we have a very personal connection to that race and that cause because Dana lost his mom to stage four breast cancer in 2016. So we noticed that you brew a beer that would be a perfect post race beverage for those virtual events that we're going to do. And you have mentioned it a little earlier, the witty and pink. And we may or may Mm -hmm. not be drinking some (laughs) as we speak. So I want to know, you said it's brewed every October and we just happened upon some, we've been saving some for this event. How did this become an annual brew for you? So two of my partners, Bill McPhee and Matt Sadie are radiologists in their in their real jobs. And one of them, Matt, actually works a lot at the Lynn Cancer Institute here in, in South Florida and works a lot with just diagnosing breast cancer. He reads a lot of scans for that. So he's just been something that was passionate about it for him. So early on, he wanted to do a beer for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. He wanted to, do, to partner with local charities. And I think I believe it was him that came up with the name Woody and Pink. It's a Belgian wit beer. It's, it's pinkish red. It's got tons of raspberries in it. Mm. So it was really his baby. And it was up to us on the brewing side of it and, and the sales and everything to put the concept together and make it a thing. So uh, the first year we did it, we did very a very small run. It was in 750 milliliter bottles, only available at the tap room. Oh. We did a little bit of draft here and there, and we did a couple events around it and raised a couple hundred dollars for a local charity. And every year, it's just gotten a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. For the last two years, we partnered with Making Strides Against Breast Cancer, a wing of the American Cancer Society. It's one of the biggest charities down here. Mm. And this year was really tough because of COVID, mm. because we weren't able to do so much of what we were able to do last year and raise as much money as we had in the past. But up until... This la- this year, we've just been able to donate more. We donate a portion, well, eventually the profits of our package and our draft sales in the month of October to Making Strides. And it's, it's just a really, it's a great thing for us to be able to do and it, being able to work with the people in that community and really bring Matt's kind of vision of what he wanted to, this beer to be and something that was dear to him. So I, I think it ticked all our boxes. Uh- I love the flavor of this beer because I don't consider it a dessert kind of beer. I think it would pair well with many different kinds of food. Am I right? Am I right? Yeah, well, so, I mean, first of all, you're right because it's your opinion, and that's what I think <laughs> is flavor. You can, you can pair that beer with anything you want. One of the things I mentioned earlier about the Wizard Wit is the fact that it's not sweet. The beer in your hand that you're drinking is not sweet. No. If anything, it has a little bit of tartness to it. Yeah. And a lot of beers, when they're done with fruit, they leave a lot of residual sugar in it. Yes. And it makes it so it's cloying. It's really good for the first couple sips, but you don't want to continue to drink it. Yeah. And we're in Florida. It's hot 99% of the time, so we want to have something that's refreshing. We want to have something that's quaffable. We want to have something that is going to be a introductory beer to a lot of people that don't necessarily like IPAs or drink craft beer or, mm. or think they like craft beer because they never tried the one that they like. So Woody and Pink was meant to be that. 
And who doesn't love a great raspberry beer? I mean, or raspberries in general, raspberry dessert, the tartness, the fruity flavors, they just kind of marry together. And this beer starts its life off as Wizard Wit. The base beer for Witty and Pink is Wizard Wit with a slightly modified orange and coriander bill. And then we build in all the the raspberry on top of it. So it's a spinoff of our classic beer. And it's something that we're able to do and and for people to enjoy. I think it's amazing that you guys develop this beer with this cause in mind. Mm -hmm. And you didn't just come up with a cool gimmick. You actually created a delicious fruited beer yeah. based on that, that classic Belgian style. And it's incredibly approachable. It's like you said, uh, not cloyingly sweet. It's something that you can drink more than one of oh, yeah. and, and not feel bloated, weighted down and, and fe- or feel like you've just had dessert. It's a fantastic offering for something that many other breweries or, or places might just make as, as a gimmick, mm. so to speak. That's important for us because, listen, I've made a lot of gimmick beers in my life. And some of those beers were really, really delicious. And they've been the catalyst for, for great growth in the industry for the, those breweries. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-mm. But I want to have, I always say that I, if we're going to do a beer with a flavor, so to speak, I want it to be a beer with a hint of that flavor. I don't want to do raspberry juice with a hint of beer. That's, uh. that, that's not, that, I, I don't think that does anyone any good. We're trying to bring people into the world of craft beer and give them something that's going to be a, an olive branch and give them a chance to go, oh, if I like this, maybe I'll have something else. Uh, yeah. you know, too often we look at some of these beers as being a little more one-dimensional or they just they're like i said the cloying sweetness is something that always gets me when it comes to a lot of these fruit beers or gimmicky beers and we're always towing that line trying to mm. get it to be something that's really drinkable really refreshing and will cross a lot of uh, boundaries i would say this one is in particular <laughs> it's sessionable and it's not overly tart it's not like uh, it's not a sour it's not a sour it's not no. pucker your oh. lips sour that's that tartness yeah and and the thing is is that just like everything else if you're a good chef you're always refining your recipes you're always tasting it going ah you know we can do a little more of that a little less of this this beer is different than it was in 2015 or 2016 we've refined this recipe over time we've worked with it we're always trying to get better we're always trying to take feedback from people and that's part of this if we just recently brought on a new brewer joel codner who's a friend of mine who i've known for years and he he came in and one of the first things i said to him is that none of our beers are finished yet even wizard which is our most popular beer and a beer that we brewed more than anything else. It's not a done. It's not a done property until you think it's the best whip beer in the history of mankind. <laughs> it probably will never get there, so it's never going to be a finished beer. We're always going to be looking at it, analyzing it, trying to trying to make it better. I love this, the Winnie and Pink. I I love that it's connected to a great cause that's near and dear to our hearts. We also love, like we said, your Parade of Souls, your Wizard Wit. And if our listeners are tantalized and want to try... And how could they not be? I know, (laughs) right? How can they get some Barrel of Monks beer? You mentioned, I think, earlier on that you picked up some of the beer at Total Wine & More. You can find Wizard Wit at Total Wine & More pretty much across the state. Uh, You can find it at pretty much every Whole Foods, uh, Mm. both Wizard Wit and our single in Havana, which is our Belgian Blonde Ale with Guava which is our, our kind of second flagship. It's another year-round beer that's been very popular for us. We actually launched that as a year-round beer during a pandemic, which is no great kidding. for sales. But it's actually done really oh. well for us. So you can find those beers pretty readily available at those kind of chains. Oh. And other than that, we do some business all over the place. We are much more popular in South Florida. So mm-hmm. if you walk into, you can walk into gas stations, you can walk into public stores, some in like Boca Raton, you can find our beer. Mm-hmm. But as a craft brewery we don't have the penetration where i can say hey any place you can buy beer you can buy wizard wit we're not quite there yet we're working on it but craft centric bars and restaurants all throughout the state you can usually see our tap handle and if you don't see it and you're interested in ask the bartender about it because they might be able to get it i'm going to tell you i we saw it on tap at number three craft brews over here in Mm -hmm. cape coral yeah in cape coral okay yeah it's a tap room and package store 
that we absolutely love that is Star Wars and Star Trek themed. And we just, oh, cool. and, and they get unique and awesome beers and it's to be expected with yours. Yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I feel like you have a big anniversary coming up. How, how many, how many years is it? And is it in March? So this will be our six year anniversary that's coming up and we're going to actually, it's usually in late March, but just because of all the holidays and everything, we're actually going to be doing the anniversary, I believe in the second week of April. Oh. I think it's April 10th. Oh, we've just pushed it off a little bit because we can. It just makes sense for us to get it past uh, all the holidays, the holiday around that time. So yeah, it's going to be April 10th. We are really doing our best to do, to do social distancing right and not pack the tap room mm. as, as full as possible and be responsible. Mm. Once again, two of my partners work in the medical field. We know how, how serious things are and we want to make sure people are staying safe. So yeah. for example, we actually just did a big can release. We've never done cans before this last Saturday. Ooh. We did a tailgate. We actually did our first, we had a, a independent company with a mobile canning line come through and we did an IPA for oh, the first cool. time and we've never done an IPA before. So we are branching out, trying some new things. We did a tailgate party around it. So everyone was nice and spaced out mm. while we won't be doing that exact same concept for our anniversary party. It'll be something similar, but we'll do our best. So we've got a big, you guys have been there. We've got a, we're in the middle of an industrial park, but yeah. over the weekends, there's no other businesses running. So we've got a Plenty huge parking. parking lot to play with. Yeah. Opportunity. Uh, so we'll, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so we'll do something with that. We're going to be releasing our, our anniversary beer. And for the first time ever, we're actually doing our anniversary beer in cans, oh. which is a beer for us. And we're doing a double IPA. And that is, as I alluded to earlier on, as a, as a Belgian brewery, we have not dipped our toe into that water so much. And we've been refining an IPA recipe over the last five years. Wow. And when we finally thought that we could do it right and we could do it as good as some of the other great breweries in Florida and all over the country, we said, hey, let's try something new. Let's try the cans out. We're still doing everything else in bottles. We're still doing our 750s. We're still doing bottle conditioning. Mm. It's not changing who Barrel Amongst is, but it's giving a different window into some other things that we can do. So we'll be releasing a double IPA that day. We'll be releasing a quadruple with coffee and cocoa nibs. Oh, hello so there. Oh. Hello, lover. Yes. <laughs> that sounds uh, amazing. <laughs> yeah. So what we're doing both those beers as a can release, as a release that day. And we'll have some real fun drafts on. We'll have some vintage beers on. And really, Aww. we're still figuring out what that day is going to look like because things are so nebulous at this point. That's yeah. what we'll be able to do, where the vaccines will be at that time. So we're just playing it by ear, but yeah. we are going to do something on that day. We are going to have a special can release, and it's going to be real cool. We may have to try to find our way over there oh, around that time. April 10th, you said, in Boca <laughs> yeah. is where your tap room is, and it's barrelamongst.com, correct? Correct. And you're on all the social media things, yes? Yeah, Just type Barrel Amongst into Facebook or Instagram <laughs> or Twitter if that's still a thing. Yeah. You can do all that. You can find us. And we'll link to all of that so that people can see what you have and, and in your feed and, and what's coming up in terms of that anniversary and, and all yeah, of the great that. things that you have in the mix because we love your brewery. We love your beer. Kevin, thank you so much for taking all of this time to talk about your brewery, your beer, more specifically your witty and pink and your passion. Your passion. That was Kevin Abbott, owner and director of operations for Barrel of Monks Brewing. I cannot wait to get over to that tap room and just have their beer in that setting and just see Kevin again. He was so generous with his time and what a knowledge bomb. Yeah, and I do love their space over there, their tap room. It's just a fantastic space, so much fun, and I love their beer. I, I really do. I haven't had a bad beer from them yet. Wizard Wit is the one that's widely available across Florida that I think you'll find at Total Wine. I hope you'll find it at ABC. We always find it at Total Wine, but I, I say check out your local package store, check out your local grocery store, see if you can get the Wizard Wit. Every October they do Witty and Pink, and sometimes there are things you can snag at this time of year like we did. Exactly. And just uh, if you're in Boca Raton, 
<sighs> visit the tap room. It's amazing. You will love it. So next week, we know we've been teasing you guys. We've been talking about this interview with I know. the mayor of running, Bart Yasso. We I delayed know. it this week. We will debut it. It's coming. We promise. It's where I'm a bit of a perfectionist, if you want to know the truth. I just want to make sure that we honor him and his time. He gave us, we asked him for 45 minutes. He gave us 90. And I just want to do it right. And we have this final push toward Donna. And then we will present this amazing series of interviews to to you. I just... with yeah. running royalty, and the guy has been so formative Stay in tuned. building Stay the tuned. running community. Yeah, it's going to be worth your wait. We can't thank him enough for his time, mm-hmm. but it's going to be a great series. You're going to yeah. enjoy it. Next week, I think we're going to continue featuring some brunch items, Ooh. including a beverage from a company that is just getting started, but is doing it right. And just stay tuned for that as well. So that said, folks, this is going to end it for another week of the Run, Eat, Drink podcast. We hope that you will join our Run, Eat, Drink podcast team and run with us to support those fighting breast cancer and their families. Visit runeatdrink.net slash Donna and join today. You can also purchase a shirt to support the Donna Foundation as well. Go to runeatdrink.net slash Donna, and you're going to see the button for each, joining the team and picking up one of the team shirts. So we really hope that you'll consider joining us to help end breast cancer. That will do it for this episode. Thank you for joining us on your long run, your commute to work, around the house, wherever you are. We're so happy that you've tuned in today. I'm your host, Amy. And I'm your co-host, Dana. Stay safe. Stay well, and we will accomplish, explore, and indulge with you really soon. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Run, Eat, Drink podcast. We're having another great year thanks to your support. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We're at Run, Eat, Drink podcast. And on Twitter, we're Run, Eat, Drink pod. You can also give us a call at 941 941- 677-2733 or send us an email at info at runeatdrink.net. Visit our website at runeatdrink.net and click on the subscribe link so you don't miss a minute. Find out how you can support the show at patreon.com slash runeatdrinkpodcast. Accomplish, explore, and indulge right along with us. We'll talk to you next time.